Perfect. All right. So let's jump right in here. Uh, so zootography is um, one of my uh, favorite uh, things to photograph, honestly. I find it a lot more challenging than uh, standard wildlife photography or any other kind of photography um, in the sense that I'm really trying to show the animals in a wild setting. So really trying to hide the fact that they're at a zoo. Um, a lot of what I have shot for uh, zoo settings um, has actually been on behalf of a lot of the zoos. So a lot of times I'm shooting so that the zoo has it to use as a social media piece or a marketing piece. Uh, so they even more so really appreciate it when it looks in a natural setting or looks like a real wildlife setting. Um, and so you'll kind of see that through a lot of the work that I'll show you today as well. I shoot a lot with uh, kind of the intent of creating it as a marketing piece. So you'll see that in some of the composition as we talk about that as well. Um, and then just one little uh, thing to point out too, if you are not seeing the screen or you're not hearing me talk, maybe try rejoining. Uh, I know Zoom every now and then uh, needs that little extra help where you might just have to rejoin to get a proper connection. All right. So what we're going to talk about here today, uh, first we'll kind of go over some different lens options. Uh, I'll talk about some of the different lenses I actually take with me while I go to the zoo and while I photograph. Um, I'll tackle some camera settings. Uh, some of these will be more Sony specific uh, features, uh, but a lot of them will be very broad. So no matter what manufacturer you use, uh, a lot of those settings will be able to carry over. Um, so the custom buttons and custom menus, uh, that stuff's going to obviously be more Sony specific. Uh, but if you're not a Sony shooter, just uh, rest your eyes for that moment and then come back and join us. Um, we'll also tackle composition. So a very simple thing that we can do to improve our photos, and it will actually improve the quality without having to invest any money. So a great, great thing to improve with. Um, and then I'm going to talk a bit, too, about some of the tips and tricks that I've learned over the years photographing in various zoos. Uh, and it, being able to improve my images just from a lot of technique and then just knowing where to be and when to be there. All right. So first thing we'll tackle is going to be uh, lens selection. Uh, so the first thing that I usually will always make sure is in the bag uh, is a wide angle lens. And a lot of times we think if I'm going to the zoo, I basically just need my telephoto lens and I'm good to go. Uh, but that's really not the case. A lot of times, especially if you travel and go to different zoos throughout the country, um, a lot of them have incredibly nice uh, aquarium kind of scenes, uh, whether that be with penguins or otters or be fish and sharks and other kind of sea creatures. Uh, but a lot of them have really great uh, aquatic scenes. And to get the most out of those scenes, you really do need a wide angle lens. If I try and shoot through the uh, glass with a telephoto lens, it's really difficult because I have a very narrow window that my subject can go in. And if I'm trying to pan with them or I'm trying to time it, it's very difficult. But if I have a wide angle lens, a lot of times what I can do is with that camera, I can have it up to the glass. And that scene or the view that I get when I have that wide lens gives me a huge perspective Pairing that with live view where I'm seeing what's right on the back of the screen, I can now watch as the animal's coming through and I know where my scene is just looking at the back screen uh, and I can wait for them to enter that scene and then start shooting. The other big advantage with a wide angle lens, and we don't really usually think about this uh, when we choose a wide angle lens, but because it's capturing such a wider field of view, my depth of field or my acceptable amount of focus gets wider or larger as well. And because of that, um, it actually helps out quite a bit uh, in terms of me not necessarily having to focus right with the animal. I can be focused in a range and wait for them to move into that range. So wide angle lens is always in the bag, always with me. There's a lot of options here. It really just depends what camera you're using. Um, not brand, but style of camera. So if we're shooting something that's a crop sensor or an APS-C size sensor, 
In the Sony family, this would be anything in that A6000 series of cameras. I'm going to be looking at the 10 to 18, which is kind of an extreme wide angle lens. If I'm shooting a full frame camera, which has the bigger imaging sensor, then I'm going to look at a few different lenses. It might be a 12 to 24, it might be a 16 to 35. Uh, it really just depends the focal length that I personally like. Um, with these, a lot of times I actually tend to gravitate more towards the 16 to 35. It's not that uh, there's anything wrong with the 12 to 24. I just like the ability, if I need to, to put filters on the front of the lens. Um, and then also I just feel more comfortable with a removable lens hood. So that if something happens to it, it's an easy enough piece to replace. Um, so I tend to gravitate more towards the 16 to 35 range. At the time as well, we didn't have the new 16 to, or 12 to 24 2.8. Uh, so a lot of times I was shooting the 16 to 35 2.8 uh, just so that I could get more light into the camera. Now with the new 12 to 24 2.8, I may uh, rethink that. Um, macro lenses are another crucial thing. So if you have a butterfly garden or any kind of uh, thing like that where you have different insects or small critters, frogs, lizards, things of that nature that you can photograph, macro lenses are awesome. They just allow us to get real up close and kind of make this tiny, tiny world a much bigger one. Uh, so I do really like to have a macro lens with me. It doesn't always necessarily have to be a true dedicated macro like what you're seeing on the screen here as well. There are some telephoto lenses that don't give me a true one-to-one -one macro, but they can actually magnify quite a bit or focus very, very close. Uh, so like in Sony, the 100 to 400 is a lot of times the lens I will go to. And that is just because, A, I have all the telephoto when I need it at the zoo. But then, B, it does a pretty darn good close focus as well. So it's not going to be a true macro lens. But in many cases, it's good enough for what I need, especially if I'm photographing bugs and things like that. The macro lenses that you're seeing up there, uh, the biggest difference that you're going to see between them is uh, basically minimum focus distance. So as that focal length changes, as we go from 30 millimeter, 50, 90, my working distance gets increased essentially. So if we think about it like this, let me find something on my desk here that I can hold up. So if we think about it like this, if this is my subject I'm photographing, that 30 millimeter macro is going to be like right on top of that subject. If I have a 50 millimeter macro, I'm now going to get a much wider uh, range between the two to get the same image. And then the 90 even more so. So if I'm photographing things like butterflies or other different bugs and stuff that are out there, the 90 is a easier tool to work with because I can get still up close uh, and personal with them, but I'm not going to be right on top of them and force them to run away. And then telephoto lenses, this is the lens that we for sure always have with us when we go to the zoo. Uh, this can be anything from a 70 to 300 or 70 to 200, uh, 100 to 400, 2 to 600, what have you. Uh, the range really is more limited based on where I'm at and where I'm shooting. Uh, in all reality, uh, for all the different zoos I've been to, uh, a 70 to 300 will really work incredibly well at any of them. Um, you can buy different lenses like a 70 to 200 that's either a 2.8 or an F4. The range is still very doable. Um, most of the exhibits that you photograph in, they're actually pretty close uh, with exception to a few. The biggest benefit in getting a 70 to 200 is really light gathering. Uh, so two pieces, that aperture if I'm in a fixed 2.8 makes it easier for me to hide fencing. Um, and then also well, hello. Um, and then also, if I'm shooting the F4 version, I get a similar kind of result out of it, but it's a lot smaller, more compact. Um, the other lens that I really like, and I've already kind of touched on this, is that 100 to 400. Uh, and the big benefit for me is that the focus is actually very, very close on it. So I can use it as a macro, air quotes macro, um, as well as my telephoto lens. All right, so we'll talk about some camera settings. Uh, so the first thing that you always want to make sure you do, because this gets bumped and changed on you, and you 
don't really pay attention to it to find out, um, is to adjust the diopter on the back of your camera. So the little rolly wheel thing next to your uh, viewfinder, right there. What this does is basically just make sure what I'm seeing in the viewfinder is actually sharp. So a lot of times if I have the camera in the camera bag and I'm not paying attention, I'll bring the camera up to my eye and things just look a little soft. Uh, and I hear the cameras focusing, I see them on the back screen and they look fine, but it doesn't quite look sharp. It's probably just that that dial got bumped. Uh, so the easiest thing there is just to, before I shoot, if I bring the camera up to my eye and I tap that shutter button, all the little writing along the bottom of the frame, I just want to adjust that dial until it's nice and sharp. The other thing that we can do there too, uh, let's say I normally wear glasses and I'd prefer to shoot without my glasses on. I can take my glasses off and then dial that in for my eye as well. In terms of an actual exposure mode uh, to photograph in, we will start with automatic. Um, so if I just bought the camera today, I'm not comfortable with it. Uh, maybe I'm pretty new to photography and I don't really understand apertures and shutter speeds as well as I want. The easiest way to do this is to go into the scene mode on the camera and we want to put it in the sports and action mode. The biggest benefits here is it's really going to dial the, really the crucial features in for us, uh, meaning it's going to try and give us the fastest shutter speed it can. So it's going to make it easier for me to freeze action. It's also going to put the camera into a continuous burst mode. So as long as I'm holding down the shutter button, it's going to keep shooting. And then also it's going to put it into a continuous autofocus mode. So as long as I'm holding halfway down on the shutter button, the camera is just going to keep refocusing, uh, which is fantastic, especially if my subject is moving uh, closer or further from me. As I'm shooting that burst, it's going to keep refocusing with my subject. Uh, so keeping them in focus in more of those frames. Uh, for those of us who are maybe a little bit more comfortable with the camera, you know, maybe we've had it for a while, we've been playing with it a little bit more, uh, we're more familiar with shutter speeds and apertures, uh, you do have two different priority modes. Uh, first one being uh, aperture priority. On here, it's going to be marked as A. Uh, if you're a Canon shooter, it'll be marked as AV. Uh, but what that'll allow me to do is set my aperture as my controllable var uh, variable. So I'm locking in that depth of field or how much focus uh, I'm allowing in, but also how much light I'm allowing into the camera. It's going to assign a shutter speed for me to pair with that. Shutter priority, or S on here, uh, if you're a Canon user, it'll be TV. Uh, it's just the opposite. I'm picking the shutter speed I want, and the camera is going to assign an aperture to make that shutter speed work. The good and the bad here. Uh, the good is I can start getting more comfortable shooting manually without having to babysit as many variables. The downside is it's still automatic. Uh, and what I mean by that is, yes, I'm in control of my aperture, but because the camera is controlling my shutter speed, I might start seeing more blur in an image if it can't give me a fast enough shutter speed for the aperture I picked. Or just the opposite, if I pick shutter priority, and let's say I picked a shutter speed that's too fast uh, and my lens can't give me enough light, it's going to start underexposing that picture or making that picture darker to give me what I asked for. So it's not a 100% win uh, going into those modes. There is still some things we have to pay attention to and watch, uh, but it does start getting us more comfortable in those modes. Because they're more of a manual mode, I'm in control of a lot of different things too. So I can set if I want the burst mode, I can set if I want continuous autofocus, I can control my ISO in the camera, all of these other variables. Uh, so I do have more control over the creation of the picture. The way I personally prefer to shoot is going to be in manual mode. Uh, and with mirrorless, I find that this is a lot easier. I'm just gonna put all of my little pop-up text stuff here on there. Um, so in manual, I'm in control of everything. I pick my shutter speed, my aperture, my ISO. The way I prefer to shoot this makes it a lot simpler though. So instead of me having to kind of watch all those variables and make sure that they're right, I keep it pretty simple. Um, so in manual mode, I will set my aperture and my shutter speed right away. 
Uh, so my aperture, I'm basically picking for what kind of depth of field I want or how much light I need to let into the camera. So this might vary based on the shoot. This might be a 2.8 aperture at times. This might be an F8 at times. Uh, a lot of it just depends on the animal or if there's a group of animal. So that's where that aperture is going to vary a little bit. My shutter speed, I just pick a shutter speed based on what I'm trying to do. So this might be a slower shutter speed, like 1 60th of a second, if I'm trying to pan with the animal and show movement. This might be faster, like 1 1,000th, if I'm trying to freeze action. Uh, this is also going to vary based on the animal as well. Uh, if I'm photographing a sloth or a red panda that's sleeping in a tree, I don't need a thousandth or a two thousandth of a second shutter speed to do that. I can get away with a slower shutter speed there. If I'm photographing uh, a cheetah and he's running across the exhibit, I'm going to need a much faster shutter speed to freeze action. What makes this simpler, because you're still probably looking at this and wondering, I thought he said this was going to be easier. What makes this simpler is that I actually just let my ISO work automatically. So I'm locking in the variables that really create the look of the photo, and I'm letting the camera fluctuate that sensitivity to light based on what it needs to do. With most of the modern cameras, you can set the camera into an auto ISO mode and let it go between 100 ISO on the low side and like 10,000 or 12,800 on the high side and actually have pretty clean images to work with. Um, now, if I have a, a much older camera, if it's maybe like five or six years old, those ISO limits are probably not going to work as well. So what I usually tell people is to play with your camera, figure out where that maximum ISO is for you. It might be 10,000. It might be 6,400. Um, you just have to kind of play and find where your personal threshold is and then set that auto ISO to work in that limit. Um, and then lenses, like I said, you can typically get away with at almost every zoo with something in a 70 to 300, 70 to 200 range, no problem. Uh, we don't always need these big, big telephoto lenses like a 600 or whatnot. Having a 600 does give me more options. I can get in tighter, do more like a portrait kind of look as opposed to full animal look. So it does give you more flexibility, but not necessarily crucial. All right. As we talk about ISO, um, and I kind of harp on this, I'm sorry, but I would rather have an image uh, like the one on the right that might be a little bit more grainy than the one on the left where I'm just going to have to delete it. And like I said, most of the modern cameras, we can push that ISO quite a bit higher um, and actually get a pretty usable image out of it as well. So drive mode on the camera, and if you're using a Sony camera, uh, one of the Sony mirrorless cameras, you'll have uh, the right side, right side, left side of your thumb button. Sorry, looking at it the wrong way. The left side on that thumb button uh, will shortcut and will bring up the drive mode for you. Uh, you're going to have a bunch of options. You'll have self timer options. You'll have a single shot, but you will have one that looks similar to this, where it's multiple boxes. And we want to enable that. Continuous burst, what that's going to do for us is as long as I'm holding down, it's going to keep shooting photos. So the reason we need that is because we want as many options as possible when we shoot. We want to set ourselves up for success. And the one thing I always tell people is to overshoot the situation. So if I'm photographing this guy swimming, I want to actually hold down that shutter button and I want to rattle off as many shots as I can. And when I get to this point and I think that's the shot, I don't want to let off at this point. I actually want to let off maybe a second or two later. So I'm actually going to end up getting a few more shots. And the problem I have found with myself and I, find, I see with a lot of other users is we tend to let off when we think we got the shot. And instead of just letting a few more frames go, and a lot of times something great can happen right after we let our finger off the shutter button and there's no way to recover in time to catch back up and get that shot. So overshoot that situation when you're shooting. So focus mode and focus area. Um, and I'll show you guys after we get through this part, I'll plug in the camera here and I'll show you where a lot of these are on the camera as well. 
uh, so that you can make these adjustments if you're not familiar. So focus mode is how the camera is going to focus. Uh, AFS is single shot focus, meaning every time I press halfway down on the button, I'm going to get a beep like so. It's not going to refocus until I lift my finger off the shutter button, press halfway down again. Continuous autofocus is quite the opposite. I'm never going to get a confirmation when I'm holding halfway down on the shutter button. Instead, it's going to constantly be refocusing. So it's never going to lock focus. It's always looking to change as my subject moves. And then we have manual focus. Uh, there's not a lot of times that I'm going to use manual focus, uh, but every now and then it happens. If I have a situation where maybe I have um, like a bird in a tree and the camera wants to keep focusing on leaves that are just in front of that bird, I can punch it into manual focus and then just override focus uh, and actually push it so that it's focusing right on the, the bird I'm intending to. So that's how the camera is going to focus. Focus area is going to be where the camera looks to focus. Um, by default, out of the box, the camera is set to wide area autofocus, meaning that it's looking at all the focus points on the frame. So uh, on some of the cameras, this might be like 178 points of focus. This might be 693 points of focus. Uh, it all varies based on the camera model you have. The good and the bad, uh, the good is that it's making use of all those focus points you paid for. The downside is this is much like an automatic mode we talked about earlier, where it's taking some of that creativity away from you, meaning it's going to put priority somewhere because it has some rules it has to follow. One of those rules, unfortunately, is whatever's closest to the frame is probably what you intend to photograph. So the downside here is there may be times where it tries to focus on a tree or a branch or something here in front of the frame that I really don't want simply because I'm using all those points. To get around that, we want to start limiting where the camera looks to focus. So I find this illustrates a little bit better if I can show you on a camera as opposed to just chatter about it. So let's change this real quick. And I'm going to set this down so that I don't make you guys all. There we go. So the easiest way to change these two variables, if I press the function button on the back of the camera, uh, if we're on Sony, that function menu, by default, I'm going to have two different pieces. Uh, I'm going to have my focus mode and my focus area. So focus mode is where I can toggle between single shot. It won't refocus until I lift off, press halfway down again. Or AFC or continuous autofocus. Um, if anyone in the crowd here is a, a Canon shooter, these are going to be one shot for AFS and AI servo for AFC. So we'll want to set that to AFC. And then if I go back into my function menu and I go to my focus area, I'm now going to have kind of a whole list of focus areas I can look at. So we can start limiting this. So if I go to zone, I now have not all my points, but I still have a pretty big grid of points to look at. I can go in and I can tell it just look at the center point. So now it's only looking at the very middle of the frame. The nice thing here is for me as the photographer, it's nice because it's very consistent. It's reliable. I know it's always looking in the middle. I just have to put the middle of my screen basically where I want it to focus. The downside, I don't always want what's in, I don't always want to compose it so that my subject is right smack dab in the middle. So you have some other options here too. We can go into a flexible spot. And within that flexible spot, you see that I have arrows on both sides. I can actually toggle this to go small, medium, or large. So a small point is going to be really just one focus point. And I can toggle all the way up to large where I'm looking at a bigger cluster of focus points. The other nice thing is I can move this all around as well, where a center point I can't. So if I want to set my subject off center, I can move my focus points over to the side and continue shooting. 
My personal favorite is to actually go in, whoops, I'm gonna to have to make a settings change here quick. Just when you think you have everything set up to work properly for your class. Um, my personal favorite is to actually go into the tracking or this may be called lock on autofocus, uh, depending on the camera model you have. Again, we notice those arrows on the side of it which means I can actually toggle between any of those previous focusing areas, but now I can uh, apply them to this tracking capability. So cover this just so you guys don't get all dizzy as we turn to the other side of the office. So as I have my tiger here, if I put my focus point where I want it, and then as I move, you can see that that focus holds with him no matter where he goes in the frame. So a very, very cool feature, very powerful feature, especially as we're trying to track an animal running, instead of me having to be incredibly talented and very good and follow uh, and not miss my focus point on the subject, I can let the camera do all the work now. I just have to get that initial focus and the camera can follow them as they run through the frame. To make that work, I do have to be in AFC. So it will not work if I'm not in AFC. Oh, and you guys are not seeing the camera right now? Hmm. Um, let's take a look here. Okay. Okay. So other people are seeing it. So it might just be a few here. And it did take it a minute to kick in here. Okay. Um, the camera I'm using right now that's hooked up on there, that one is an R4. The one that you see me on right here is an A6400. Um, the A6400 is also doing the tracking thing, so no matter where I move in the frame, you can see it follow me around. Let's run and jump back to here. All right, so in many situations when I'm at the zoo, well, I'll say almost all situations. I'm usually in continuous autofocus, and I'm typically in that lock-on or tracking autofocus mode as well. Uh, there is a very new feature that got added uh, in some of the recent cameras called Animal Eye Autofocus, where it can actually now recognize an animal's eye, and it can actually track and focus with them as well. Um, like many technology features, uh, it's one of those things that just gets better and better and better with every generation of camera that comes out. Uh, the computing power just gets better and the processing or the algorithm in it actually just gets better as well. Uh, so if we want to use animal eye autofocus, and I'll show you here real quick on my camera, make sure that this hops over right away again. Uh, so if we go into our menu, and not all cameras have this. Um, this came out with the A6400, uh, and then everything that's been current since has it. And then with a firmware update to the A7R3 and the A7 III, uh, animal eye autofocus got added. Also, if you have an RX10 Mark IV, animal eye autofocus got added. Uh, so depending on the camera model you have, this is located in a slightly different spot, but it's typically in that first camera tab and that's usually about page five or six. Uh, but you'll have a setting that says face or eye autofocus setting. If I click into here and I go down, I have an, op or an option for subject detection or basically what kind of subject are we looking at? And I can toggle between humans or animals. So if I set it to animal real quick, we'll see if it'll grab, I'm pretty far away, but Oops, let's go up to here. There we go. Oh, there we go. Um, so it can actually focus on their eye and track their eye for me. So pretty cool feature. Um, it's whichever one you prefer. The trade-off, unfortunately, is that if I'm in that animal eye autofocus mode, I can't also be in the tracking mode. So I do have to pick which one I prefer to use. 
All right. We'll get back to the show here. So that kind of brings us into some customization on the Sony cameras here now too. Uh, so again, if you're not a Sony user, I'm sorry, bear with us for just a couple minutes here uh, as we kind of quickly jump through this. The cool thing on the Sony cameras though, almost every button on the camera can be customized. So I can actually set specific features that as I'm shooting, borrow my camera again here, as I'm shooting and I don't want to remove my eye from the viewfinder, I can set a specific button that just shortcuts into an item. Uh, so that way I don't have to leave the moment to make an adjustment. To do this, uh, that second camera tab on your menu, and it's typically the like second to last or third to last page in your menu uh, on that second tab. And you have an option called custom key or custom key settings. Depending on your camera, this will look a little different. Uh, you may have a list view where it's going to tell you what the button is and what's currently assigned to it. Or you'll have one like this where you have multiple pages uh, and it'll show you a specific button on the camera and what's set to it. But this is where um, we can set up a lot of different things. Some of the things I actually like to do is I like to, um, if you're on an A7 series camera, the C1, C2 buttons that are up on the top, I like to set those to be my focus area and focus mode, just so they're very quick. They're right next to the shutter, so it's an intuitive kind of reach for my finger. If I have a lens that has a button on it, uh, kind of like the bottom right on the screen here as you're seeing, I like to set that to do autofocus, manual focus toggle. Then instead of me, as I'm shooting, having to pull my head away from the camera, find the button on the side of the lens and switch it to manual focus, I can just press it with my thumb. It's very comfortable to reach to and very quick. And then I can just continue shooting. I don't have to think about it. The next level of customization that we have, so I showed you that function menu earlier and navigating some items in that. That is also completely customizable. So you can change everything that's in that function menu. So if there's features here that you're never going to use, maybe I don't use a flash ever. Uh, I can get rid of those flash modes and I can put things like the toggle between animal eye autofocus and human eye autofocus, uh, things like that. This feature is found right next to that custom key setting. So again, second tab close to the end of the pages um, and you'll have an option called function menu settings. It's going to look pretty similar. Um, you're going to either have a list of options and what's currently assigned to it, or it'll actually just show you your function menu and you can click on the tile and reassign something else to it. The last level of customization is the uh, My Menu settings. So I kind of show these in three waves. And the main reason is the custom buttons are things that I want one button pressed. I want to be in that feature right away. So these are things that I want to be able to do as I'm shooting. I don't want to have to look for anything. The function menu might be things that I want some urgency to it. I want it quick and accessible. Uh, so maybe this is switching to silent shooting or turning stabilization off in the camera, anything like that. The my menu are things that are more, uh, in my opinion, like setup oriented. You know, I'm going to set this up before I start my shoot or I'm done with the shoot and I want to format my card but I don't want to go look for it every single time I need to format my card. So I can save, I believe it's like 30 pages worth of items on here. And they're about six items per page. So you can make your own full menu if you want, uh, or you can just set a couple key items here as well. All right. So now we'll jump into some composition. So composition is the one thing that we can really improve on and it really doesn't matter what kind of camera we're using. If our composition gets better, our image quality gets better as well. So the first big thing is being aware of our borders and our backgrounds. Uh, I'm as guilty as everyone clearly because I have sample photos that show this uh, so I can teach from them, uh, but we get so tunnel visioned on an animal that we stop paying attention to what's going on on the edges of my frame and what's going on behind me in the frame as well. So 
probably the number one thing I see uh, might even be something simple like this, where I've got my subject, but I'm not really paying attention to my backgrounds, and now I have kind of a big distracting, might be a branch running through their head, or in this case, it's a branch, but it's a very bright colored branch. So it actually pulls the viewer's eye away. Problem with a bright subject in the frame is my eye is going to gravitate towards it as the viewer because it's the brighter piece in the frame. So we either need to put our subject in that bright area or we need to hide it from the frame altogether. So this is a simple fix. It's just being aware. And all I'm really doing is instead of me shooting at my normal height, I'm just going to kneel down and shoot. And when I do that, now that branch has moved up and out of my frame and I can shoot actually more eye level with the subject as well. So now it starts to hide some of those background uh, disturbances from the image. This one's, a, again, kind of a very subtle one. Uh, tiger waking up from a nap, giving me the big yawn, uh, showing some teeth, things like that. Not paying attention because I'm just so caught up in the moment, but I actually have some sticks and stuff starting to hang into my frame over here. So the purist would tell you that I should change my perspective. So instead of me standing here, I should move over to the side and shoot uh, to eliminate those. The modern photographer will tell you, I can just fix that in Photoshop. Uh, I'm not going to tell you one is right or one is wrong. Uh, you have to choose what works best for you. If you have the means to just get it right in the camera, that's technically, I mean, that's my preferred way to do it. Uh, but something like this is not that difficult of a fix in Photoshop either. Something like this is a much more difficult fix. Um, again, not really paying attention. If I could have changed my view or my perspective, I could have hidden those branches as well. Uh, unfortunately, we're clipping just a little bit of his ear. And this is probably the toughest one because you don't really catch it at the time. And that's when I have things in the foreground, but because we're either using a bigger telephoto lens or we're using a, like a 2.8 lens that has that bright aperture, I get foreground obstructions, but they're so defocused, I don't see them at the time I'm shooting. So it's not until I get home, I have stuff on the computer screen that I now notice it. So something like this, unfortunately, is after the fact, I can't change my perspective. So this leads me to another thing I'll tell you in a little bit here, but to shoot a little bit wider so that you actually have some kind of crop capabilities or crop options. On this one, I would probably just crop it right along with that branch. And actually, I think we can do this cool little thing here. Uh, but I'd probably just crop right along here and maybe even right along there. Because all I'm really losing is some defocused uh, red panda butt, which it's adorable, but it's not going to make or break the photo. So I can actually just uh, let that part be my crop. There we go. So that's probably what I would do is after the fact, crop and remove that obstruction. So something like this um, is a whole different photo though. Uh, so on this one, the actual animal is not my subject. My subject is all of that beautiful, beautiful plumage uh, on display. And so what I wanted to do is actually fill that frame with just that plumage. Uh, and you can see if you look closely, I'm gonna even remove my camera here real quick. Uh, if we look up in that top right corner, you can see I started getting some of his feathers over here that are just starting to fall apart. And so as I was shooting, I actually consciously uh, zoomed in a little bit tighter so that we could start hiding some of that because that's not going to add anything to the photo. It's only going to take away from the photo. Uh, similar, his legs in the photo aren't going to add anything. It's now going to add kind of a whole layer of non-plumage, which would be a distraction anyway. So I'm okay with cutting his legs off on this one and just keeping the feathers filling the entire frame.
So I talked about bright spots in the frame and how we ideally don't want to have them competing with my subject. So in this photo, I uh, actually consciously recomposed myself so that I put the bird over the bright part of the frame and left that darker side of the frame. I tend to shoot a lot of stuff like this, and it's mainly because it gets used by the zoos themselves for different social media campaigns or marketing pieces. And if we look on that left side of the frame, although it's just blank, not really anything happening, it's a perfect spot for them to put a little uh, advertisement piece. Uh, you can put some text over top of that, whatnot, and it stands out great. Our subjects also tend to have an orientation to them. So some of them will actually photograph better horizontally as opposed to vertically. So we want to recognize that when we're photographing the animal too. Uh, both of these guys, I could have shot it horizontally and fit them in the frame. The downside is what am I adding to the image then? Nothing, right? I'm just adding more exhibit. Uh, and in some cases, making it more obvious that I'm at a zoo or making it more obvious um, yeah, then I'm at a zoo, uh, but it's just adding nothing really to the image. So if I shoot it vertically, I can get in tighter with the animal, can have them fill more of that frame, and it's more engaging. The other thing we want to do as well, we want to leave room for that animal to move into the frame. So if I'm photographing this, I don't want to crop it so that if they're facing this way, the frame ends right at their nose. I want to make sure that they have more than enough room to walk into it. If we cut it right at their nose, the viewer unfortunately gets kind of distracted and starts wondering what's just to the right of this or just to the left of this. Um, so we do want to make sure that we give them room to move into that frame. So as I spoke of earlier, I tend to like, so this is a, just a standard out of the camera shot, uh, but I tend to like to give a little bit more room when I'm photographing uh, than I need. And that is so that when we get back to the computer or if I deliver this to, uh, let's say the zoo, they have some options to work with as well. So they may decide, well, we need a new membership sticker uh, or you know, we have a, maybe a monthly newsletter that we do and this is gonna be the cover of it. They have the option now to shoot this or crop this vertically for that. They may say, nope, this is just going to go on Facebook or it's going to go on computers or, you know, we're going to set it for that. Now they can actually crop it horizontally and they can work within that means as well. So again, I'm shooting for a little different uh, reason than most are. Uh, for me, I'm trying to deliver a product that they can use. For some of us, we just love going to the zoo. We love photographing animals. Shoot what makes you happy then. Again, I shot this a little wider than I probably needed to, and it was just so that they have an option if they needed to. So in terms of some of the compositional rules out there, uh, animals are fantastic for symmetry uh, because they are very symmetrical. Uh, so if you can shoot head on, it's fantastic. A lot of times I find uh, at zoos, Especially, I can photograph a lot of stuff by water where I can get some great reflection shots. Uh, this is a photo that I come home with often and I get made fun of by my wife that I went to the zoo and photographed 500 shots of geese. But it is a great spot to photograph geese. So again, just another reflection shot. This is a uh, older shot that I had taken. The new me, the more current shooter me, would have shot this wider so I had more things uh, that I could do with it. The younger version of me wanted everything to be in as tight as possible uh, so that I was right there with the animal. Uh, so new me would have said, shoot it a little wider, give yourself some options. Sometimes the exhibit is not gonna work with you uh, and it's gonna be very obvious that I'm at a zoo. Uh, this might be some of the older generation zoos or even some uh, zoos that were, you know, from the start of zoos here in the country. And unfortunately, they're labeled as a landmark and they can't update them. They have to leave them the way they were. So sometimes those 
are going to fight with me and I have to figure out another creative way to work around it. Filling the frame is a great compositional rule to get around that. And really, I'm just going to take my subject and I'm just going to have them fill as much of that frame as I can. So both of these guys, in behind them, uh, there was fencing. I think in behind this guy, there was actually like above his head, if, we, if I had a zoomed out shot. Uh, you can actually see them with construction stuff working on another exhibit behind them. Again, if I have a exhibit that's just not helping me, there's no way I can hide there in an exhibit. Sometimes I look for different kind of creative ways to use it as composition. So something like this where I'm building a frame around my subject. Or something like this where I'm building again a frame around my subject. So kind of locking the viewer's eye in with that subject using that frame. And this frame doesn't always have to be solid like it is here where it's solid branches. Sometimes it can be pieces of different uh, things like here it's a log and two rocks, but the way they are, it ends up making a frame around that subject and kind of locking your eye in with them. So again, uh, there's no way for me to hide this shot that we're at a zoo because I have to shoot up at these birds and inevitably you're going to see all the rafters, all the scaffolding, all of that. So instead we start working with different compositional rules and just, whoops, let it be what it is. Um, random animal fact for you guys, since I'm assuming everyone here is a fan of animals. Uh, these are rhinoceros hornbills. And the very cool thing with them is the way you can distinguish the male from the female is by the color of their eye. So the males have the bright red eyes. I believe they're the ones with the bright red eye. And then the females have bright blue eyes. So random animal fact for you for tonight. So rule of thirds is something I use a lot. And it's because I'm, again, trying to deliver that image with that blank space. Uh, for them to drop any kind of marketing piece that they want in there. So I'm stacking my subject on one of those third lines because as the viewer, your eyes tend to go to those third markers. Uh, if at all possible, I really like to stack the key point of interest. So in here, it would have been his face on intersecting point for those lines. The very cool thing is if you want to start practicing rule of thirds, uh, and you have a Sony mirrorless camera, you can actually enable grid lines on your camera and you can actually have that rule of thirds show up on your viewfinder or on your uh, back screen. So you can see it as you're shooting and it makes it a lot easier too because you can very consciously place your subject. So something like this works super well for rule of thirds because uh, as the viewer, your eye does this little ping pong piece where it kind of bounces back and forth between the two of them. And we kind of talked about this uh, facing into the frame. Um, so again, I want to leave them room to walk uh, in the frame. I don't want to cut it off at their nose. All right, so now we'll start tackling some different tips and tricks. So I'm assuming most of you have had all kinds of fun uh, trying to shoot through like barriers and stuff like that. Uh, so we'll make sure we talk about that as well so we can set you guys up for success here. Uh, the first thing I really like to point out is timing. So first off, so you guys know I'm not a liar. Um, this is still the same bird with the red eye. I promise you the female does have blue eyes. Um, but timing uh, of when we go to the zoo. So not only what time of day, but what time of year we go as well. So ideally, if I'm going to go to the zoo and I'm going to shoot, I want to either get there right when they open or usually maybe like an hour or two hours before they're going to close, uh, depending on what I'm trying to shoot. Main reason for that, the animals are going to be most active during these hours. So right when they go out on exhibit, uh, 
they tend to go out and see what has changed on their exhibit overnight. So they're out sniffing, smelling, remarking spots. They're active and moving around. Uh, if we can get there usually like an hour and a half, two hours before they're going to uh, go back inside for the night, they're also active because they're now, okay, you know, dinner time is just about to happen. They're getting active. They're moving around. They're ready for dinner. The other thing too is especially if you're a member of your zoo, you probably already know a lot of the scheduled stuff, but if they have any kind of trainings that they do with the animals during the day, that is also a great time to go uh, because they are going to be active. They're going to be motivated. They're going to be rewarded for being up and moving around. So try and find out those key things. Uh, time of year makes a big difference too. If I go during the summer when it's brutally hot, a lot of the animals are going to be finding shade somewhere and laying down, not moving, uh, just to stay cool. Uh, so if I can go in the fall, in the spring, honestly, the winter is a fantastic time to go to the zoo and shoot, especially if you can happen to uh, be available to go on the first day of snow. The animals go bonkers on the first day of snow. Uh, so it's a great, great thing as, a, as well. Um, another cool thing, uh, so at the Minnesota Zoo, uh, they're nearby to a tornado siren, which goes off on the first Wednesday of every month. So the cool thing is when that starts going off, a lot of times you can get some of these other animals, uh, maybe coyotes or wolves, who will actually howl uh, as they're competing with that siren. So you can get some cool shots for different things like that as long as you know to look for them. So the other uh, tip that I like to give is dress the part. So when you go to the zoo uh, and you see the zookeepers, take note of what they're wearing. Uh, so this is at the Minnesota Zoo. Uh, so if I go to the Minnesota Zoo, I tend to wear a like Kelly green shirt or a Kelly green uh, hoodie. And the main thing there is if you think about it this way, the animal sees that keeper every single day, every week, all year long. That's the person that lets them in, lets them out, feeds them, gives them treats, trains them, works with them, talks to them all the time. So that uniform is something they recognize right away. So this might be something where they're laying on the ground sleeping. And if I'm walking by and I'm just looking the part, they're not necessarily going to get up and come over and see me, but they might lift their head up and look to make sure I am a keeper or I'm not a keeper. So there's a lot of times where I've gotten some great shots and it's simply because of that few seconds of interaction that I can get simply because they're trying to make sure I am or I'm not, am I a keeper? So it's not going to work every time. It's not going to give you a whole lot of time, but it will help. The unfortunate thing here is if your zoo uh, if their uniform for uh, zookeepers is like full khaki, I'm sorry, but uh, take it or leave it, I guess. So I'm going to assume that many of us have had issues shooting through fencing. Um, so the first thing that we really want to do when we uh, have to go and have to shoot through the fence is we want to get as close to that fence as we can. Closer I can get to it starts to minimize how much it's going to be in the frame. It also, the closer I get to it, the more it's going to defocus and hide in the frame as well. So this might be physically getting closer. This might be zooming my lens in to get closer. Again, ideally, if I can aim through one of the center openings on that mesh, I'm going to have less disturbance in it. Um, and then also, if I'm using a lens that can open up the aperture more, it's going to defocus or hide it better as well. That being said, there's some things that um, you may shoot and you might say, you know, it always looks terrible, it doesn't matter what I'm doing. Some of it might be the location you're picking to shoot through as well. So if we're shooting through this part of the fence, my images are always going to look like this. So they're going to be hazy, they're going to be pretty flat, borderline unusable. If we go back and I decide I'm going to shoot through this part of the fence instead, that's now my image. 
And the big difference there is I'm shooting in a shaded part of the fence as opposed to something that's having a lot of reflection coming off of the fence. So picking the right spot makes a huge difference. I'm still going to have kind of that same thing. If I can't get close enough to the fence or if I can't defocus it enough, I might still see some of that mesh in there. Uh, but picking a part that's shaded is going to help tremendously. So this is the other uh, nightmare of the zoo, and that is photographing through glass. Uh, glass presents a bunch of different challenges. So first off, it usually looks like this. So it's got all kinds of goobers and who knows what on it, right? So the first tip, have a rag with you. Uh, doesn't, don't like spray it down with uh, anything, just a normal rag. And a lot of times you can usually wipe out a clean space on the glass. So this is something that I keep in the camera bag just to help, if I can, uh, help clean the glass a little bit. As we look at this image, and I'm just using this really for the panes of glass on the window here. So ignore the animal for right now, ignore uh, the zookeeper for right now. So as we approach these pieces, this area, so like maybe a foot up, up to probably about like three and a half, four feet is almost always unusable. Uh, and it's really just that that's the prime zone where all the little kids have their faces on the window. So it's all fingerprints, nose prints, scratches, smudges galore. So we're going to assume that that's usually unusable. So that leaves me that like bottom foot if I want to get low and I want to shoot through that. Uh, or I'm going to have kind of this target area. So out of reach is really going to be anything that's, I would say, probably like six and a half, seven feet and above. Uh, a lot of that, I'm instead of me holding my camera up and trying to shoot over my head, a lot of times I can try and shoot through something more eye level. Now, that being said, that top section isn't always good either, because uh, unfortunately, there's still a lot of adults who do the same thing that the kids do. But if we look at this piece of glass, uh, especially multi-pieces that have that seam, you've usually got about a like four to six inch chunk on each side of that seam that's pretty clean, uh, that not a lot of people are usually touching for whatever reason. And the way to kind of think about it is if I'm walking up to look at an animal not taking pictures, I'm probably not going to stand at the seam and try and look back and forth on it. So that does buy you a little bit of real estate along that seam. Uh, sometimes there's just nothing you can do. All of the problems are on the other side of the glass. The other problem that we really get presented with uh, when we're photographed through glass is there's a color shift. Uh, so if we look at the one on the left, it's got kind of this like bluish greenish tint and what we're going to do is actually bias our white balance. Um, so on your camera, and I'm going to flip over to camera mode here quick, and I saw that we had some comments and maybe some questions here. So I'll try and tackle some of those here as well. There we go. So if we switch to my camera here, so if we go into that function menu, I'm just going to block this here real quick and we go into our auto white balance. So I can still leave this in automatic where I'm not having to adjust it or change it, but you can notice that there's an arrow to the right of it. So I press to the right, I get this little color grid. And so let's just point over here. And what I can do is I can actually start to bias that color. I'm gonna go extreme just so you can see so if I'm shooting through a piece of glass that's giving a very blue uh, kind of cast to it, I can actually warm it up and override that blue color tone that's coming through it. Uh, and it actually works really, really well. I'm going to show you here in just one second uh, how well that actually works. So my, my favorite bears here. So shooting with white balance, just automatic, zeroed out, shooting through the glass. Unfortunately, that glass gives a very like bluish greenish cast to it. And then shooting with it biased warm. 
So it actually corrects a lot of what I'm getting out of that glass. The one thing to remember, change this back to zero uh, after you're done. Otherwise, things are going to start looking a little wonky for you. And this you can only change if we're in one of the manual modes. So I can't do this in uh, scene automatic mode. Uh, I can do it in aperture priority, shutter priority, program, or manual. The other issue that we really run into a lot with glass is reflection. Um, I've tried, like this gentleman here is using a polarizer. I've tried that. I don't have great results with it, and it tends to be that it just can't correct enough. There's so much usual glare on the glass, and it's just not enough correction. So your best bet is actually usually to use a lens hood, and we'll get to that here in a second. But we also uh, want to be right up on the glass when we're shooting too. Think about it like this. That glass, even though you know, we never really pay attention to it or acknowledge it, is actually very, very thick, very thick glass. And the problem is if I shoot and I shoot at an angle through that glass, my images are going to look soft. And it's because it's getting skewed going through that thick, thick pane of glass. So if I shoot head on through the glass, I actually get a much sharper image because of that. Still going to lose some detail because it's a very thick piece of glass, but it's much better than if I'm trying to shoot at an angle. The other thing that we'll see is glare. Uh, again, I've had a polarizer. I've tried a polarizer many times. A lot of times it just can't quite get rid of everything that's there for glare. But if you have your lens hood, if you have your lens hood on the lens and you just put it right up on the glass, you're going to go from something like this where I have all of those guys uh, to something like that, where it actually minimizes and hides almost all of it. And the last tip that I like to give to people is to be patient. So a lot of times, you know, we go to the zoo, um, and especially if it's a zoo I've never been to before, and I might only have that one day at the zoo, it's a really tough thing because I want to see it all. I want to be able to photograph it all. But you kind of have to be patient, give the animals time to warm up and do stuff as well. Um, there's been countless times where I've walked up to an exhibit. I have the camera. I'm ready to go. I look. No, nah, I don't really see anything. And I take off. And you get like 100 feet away, and all of a sudden you're hearing, oh. And by the time you get back, there's a massive crowd there, and now you've got two bears wrestling or something of that nature. So a lot of times I tell people, be patient spend some time at the exhibit, just take it in, just relax and watch. Because uh, things happen, animals spontaneously decide they're going to start being crazy uh, and wrestling with each other or playing with some of the enrichment that's on exhibit. So give them time. Now, that being said, if they're laying and it's the middle of the afternoon and they're laying under a tree, pretty unlikely they're going to get up from under that tree and go do something. So. But be patient, give yourself time at the exhibit. So especially if you're a member, uh, like if I'm a member at the zoo, a lot of times I'm picking like one or two exhibits I'm gonna shoot. And I spend most of my time at those two, or I have a favorite animal that I'm gonna go spend a large chunk of time at. So even if I'm just sitting there watching the animal, observing the animal, I'm still waiting. But just a little recap, I'm gonna put all of this up here. Um, so choosing our exposure mode, again, just choose what fits uh, your comfort with the camera. That can be more of the sports mode in the camera. That can be full manual. We just want to make sure we're in uh, a mode that allows us to be in continuous autofocus and continuous uh, burst mode. Uh, while we're there, some things to practice, some of your composition. So using the exhibit for framing, uh, practice your rule of thirds. For barriers, we want to get right up on them if we can. Uh, so if we have the fencing or the netting, we want to get as close to it as possible. The glass, we want to make sure we have our lens hood and put our lens hood right on the glass. Uh, and then be patient. Uh, take your time while you're there. Enjoy it. So let's pop open some questions here. Um, let's see. 
So one of the questions was, what is my preferred aperture when I'm shooting through chain link? Um, typically like an F 5.6 or lower. Uh, once we start going over a 5.6 aperture, uh, it starts to become much more noticeable. Not that I'm necessarily going to actually see the, the chain link, but you will get kind of a weird, uh, I don't think I have one in here that shows it, but you'll get kind of a weird patterning in the frame uh, if our aperture is stopped down too much. Um, and then the question, does shooting a lower aperture number uh, help when shooting through the glass like the fencing? No, um, it, it really doesn't because um, it's not necessarily hiding anything that that like the fencing does. So a lot of animals, uh, you know, we might have like a 70 to 200 to 8, and we really want to use that 2.8 aperture. Problem is from snout to eye at 2.8, I might have a sharp eye and a soft nose or a sharp nose and a soft eye. So a lot of times I'd like to push my aperture to like a 5.6, just so I have enough depth of field uh, to get their whole head in focus, because that's what my customer is going to engage with. That's what the viewer is going to engage with. Uh, but no, you don't get that same advantage shooting through glass that you do with fencing. And let's see here, let's pop up the, the Q and A. Um, then we had a question, does the AF tracking work with any brand lens? Um, as of the current ones out, I believe so. Um, so, yes, the, like Tamron lenses and the Sigma lenses, the tracking does work with them. The trade-off might be the focusing speed of those lenses might not take full capability of what the camera can do. Uh, example being, if we have like an A9 that can shoot 20 frames a second, some of those lenses can't physically focus fast enough, so you're probably only going to get like 10 frames a second out of the camera. Um, recommendations for raw JPEG. Um, so I've shot for many years. Um, and when I first started out and I was shooting my DSLR, I always shot raw. And that was because I really wanted and kind of needed that safety net that raw gives us. Um, not to uh, reteach old stuff here, but in case anybody's unfamiliar, uh, raw really gives you an unbaked file. So you have just everything at your access. You have uh, a greater exposure range, uh, but it comes to you unsaturated, uh, unsharpened, all of that. So you do have to go into software and create your look, but it does give you a lot more capability. And when I shot a DSLR, we didn't get real-time feedback. Instead, it was, you know, I'd take the picture and I might have to review it a few times until I was comfortable, and then I could just keep shooting. The problem is sometimes the animal might move from a very bright situation to some shaded area. And if I'm not paying attention, my exposure went from being spot on to very dark all of a sudden. Um, so RAW gave me that safety net to make that exposure correction in the computer after the fact. As of recently, I pretty much only shoot JPEG anymore on the camera, and that's because I get to see it live as I'm shooting it. So right away, I know if it's too dark or too bright. And the benefit for me is that now the camera is doing a lot of the work that I used to have to do. So I don't have to do saturation and noise reduction or any of that because the camera is applying it. And the benefit is my memory cards hold significantly more pictures. I don't have to spend as much time on the computer editing. Uh, the camera just delivers me the file I want. So it's tough, especially as we've been very comfortable shooting raw and we've kind of got this whole work flow down for raw. Uh, so I, I would like to invite you guys to transition out of raw if, you're, if you want to. There are certain situations if I'm shooting landscape photography or architecture stuff that I still shoot raw because there's that greater exposure correction that I may need. But for shooting at the zoo, I would say shoot RAW plus JPEG to begin with. And as you look at them, uh, see if you really see a huge difference between them. 
Uh, the reality is most cameras have more than enough resolution anymore that even that JPEG file, I can print a poster print and it's going to look great. RAW just gives me a lot more of everything. Unfortunately, it takes up a lot more space to house it as well. Um, so as of lately, I've been shooting mostly JPEG, uh, actually to the point that one of the last weddings I shot, I actually shot the whole thing in JPEG as well. Uh, and it turned out wonderful and it made my life a whole lot easier not having to convert thousands of files to JPEGs as opposed to just some small tweaks here and there and the way I, way I go. So. Cool. Uh, any other questions that you guys may have, whether it's results or the, whether it's uh, regarding zoo photography or Sony cameras or any of that? If you guys have any questions, fire away. Absolutely. You're very welcome. So if that's all we've got for questions, I'll let you guys enjoy your evening. Thanks for joining me. And hopefully you guys learned something uh, fun and good here. So awesome. Have a great night, guys.